know, but I'm, I'm just kidding. It is great. It is great to see everyone this evening. Is anybody excited about the last Wednesday of the month? Can somebody tell me what we are doing? Because this Wednesday is special. Oh, wow. Pastor got to it. Come on. What are we doing this evening? Yes, we are um, having the forum. So the forum is a platform where we get to ask questions and we have our Bible experts, our Bible scholars. <laughs> you know, um, we have, we've heard the word of God. The seed has been sown in our hearts. So now if you have questions, um, you get to ask and they can answer those questions for you. For those that are joining us online, welcome to DIC Spring, where we raise pay setters and role models who reign in absolute dominion. If you also have questions, you are welcome to type it in the chat box right there, and we will get to it. It is not too late. If you have a pen and paper and you want to write something down, please do um, take notes. So without further ado, um, I would like to... Um, bring up our panelists, um, to bring up the pastors. Um, let me start with, um, let me start with Pastor Kola, Pastor Kola Olaleye, our pastor, my pastor. Give it up for Pastor Kola. And without further ado, Pastor Sheum, our gorgeous pastor, filled with the word of God, filled with the spirit of God. And um, thank you both. Thank you both for being up here in the hot seat. Um, and I think I'm going to keep using this mic, if that's okay. All right. So this month, since we are all Bible students, can somebody remind me <laughs> what we have been talking about for the past three Wednesdays? You know, since we are all, we've been all taking notes. Should I remind us? We've been talking about discipleship. We've been talking about the, the cost, what it means to follow Christ. Um, Pastor Kola started, kicked off the topic um, of discipleship. And I'm going to start tonight. Let me open my notes here. Pastor Kola started on the first two Wednesdays talking about discipleship, what it means to be a true disciple, um, and talking about evangelizing, but then discipleship, that we don't stop there, we keep going. Um, and he continued with defining what a disciple is and the cost of discipleship. And Pastor Sheon, you also just went further with that and deeper with that by also telling us the rewards of discipleship. So we have some questions here. Um, and if you don't mind, I believe um, Pastor Kola, you started us um, with the book of Mark chapter 8, verse 34. But I'm going to go into the first question. So the first question says, is being a follower another way to say one is a believer or are they different? So being a follower and being a believer, um, are they the same? Are they different? Does anyone, do you want to volunteer or should I? You'll go. <laughs> Pastor Sion said, I'll go first. I'll go first. Okay, go ahead. disciple is one who follows and in order for you to follow you have to receive that person that you want to follow so salvation is the first call um before you can become a disciple of Jesus Christ is how then do you receive and follow him if you don't accept him as your lord and savior and so once you've received him then you have to obey the call to follow him be his disciple you know do all that is required by doing okay thank you can can we give it up for her thank you so being, a, you said we have to be a believer first and then be a follower of Christ, be a disciple. Pascola, do you want to add anything to that? 
I, I think she, she hit the nail on there. I just want to add a few things, uh, come something with that. Oftentimes, many of us just get to a point where we come to church and we hear the word of God and we come to a point where we say, accept the Lord. And, and we think that is the end of this journey, but it's actually the beginning of the journey. So when we, when we believe and we are a believer, um, I don't... I, don't think Jesus ever called anyone, went to them, preached to them, and said, just believe alone. I think when he saw the, the people, when he called them, he said, be followers. He uh, said, follow me. Uh, and so when he said, follow me, which means the beginning is exactly what Pastor Chung said. It's believing is just the beginning. And then the real call is to follow because Anyone who stays stagnant in that, you always fall back to where you are. But if you don't keep moving, then you 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 you, you become a victim. Okay, um, thank you for expanding on that. It's similar to not similar, but it, it does tie to when um, you had mentioned um, quoting Mark Mark sixteen fifteen, where Jesus told the um, disciples at this point, the apostles that go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And it's not like you just stop at preaching it. You are making disciples of all nation. So it, a follow-up question to that would be, um, the person is asking, so why is it important for me to be a follower? You had touched on that a little bit by saying you don't want to be stagnant, but can you expound on that, Pastor Kola? Yes, you're right. Because everything... Um, let, let me give you an example. You, if you accept into a college a, and you just have the, fa the acceptance letter, does not make you a graduate. You never know what's going to come out of it until you finally attend. But if you don't want to go to college because of some things you're enjoying, the money you're making, you never know what's on the other side of following through with that. So the invitation to be a believer is the first call, Gus, is you've got your acceptance letter. Is the way I look at it. But that following is what makes you truly, uh, makes everything about what that business is fall into you. It, it, when you follow through is when everything about the college comes inside of you. But if you stay out there and just say, I've got acceptance letters, everybody has acceptance letter. Well, most people have acceptance letter. Bible even says many are called, but few are chosen. Those who... Go further, go deeper, get to experience the value of that. It comes with responsibilities and, 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 and sacrifices, but that's where the true journey of a believer starts in the followership because that's where you learn everything you, you, that it means to be a believer in the first place. So you, you're putting into practice, you receive the invitation, but you are now living it out by following Okay, Christ's if principles. Can, if I can yes. Add to that, I believe completely what Pastor Paula said, but if we think of who God is, He is a multiplier of every good thing, right? Mm -hmm. So when He called, when He made Adam and Eve, He told them to be fruitful and multiply. When God gave His Son, when Christ came to save us all, that was back in how many years ago? Two, about over 2,000 years ago. So just imagine if the apostles didn't do the work, if they did not disciple then how would we have known all those things that were recorded? So it's very important not just to stop at being a believer, but to follow, be a follower because that's the essence, right, of why Christ died, so that the gospel can be propagated, so that he came to die once and for all, for however many billion or however many generations we'll have. But it is our work. He finished his work. So our work is to continue that by telling other people. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Because he died Wherever he died, doesn't mean like we that are in uh, Timbuktu are going to hear about it. People have to go. So it's so important because that is the essence. Christ came to die for all, and we all have to hear it. Right. Oh, thank you for that. Awesome. Um, I'm going to move to the second question. It says, sometimes um, it is difficult to deny myself of the things I used to do that I enjoy. And um, perhaps this is touching on when you mentioned the cost of discipleship. 
um, and that we should deny what Jesus said. If you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. Um, I'm going to start with Pastor Shion on this one. Um, it says, sometimes it is difficult to deny myself of the things I used to do that I enjoy, even though I know I must let it go to grow and to follow God. How can I do this? How? I'm glad the person understands that they have to stop doing those things, right? Because as it says, I believe it was in Mark chapter 8 where Jesus was saying, um, essentially, to give to follow me, to be a follower, means you have to give up your own life for my sake and for the sake of the good news. That means you have to abandon your agenda, the, the old self, right, and follow me. But we all know that without the Holy Spirit, you can't do anything. So if you try on your own, whether it's to break, break a bad habit, it doesn't even have to be anything major, like an addiction, it takes the help of the Holy Spirit. Because by flesh, we can't prevail, we can't do anything of ourselves. Um, so it's very important to, to key into the Holy Spirit, to acknowledge the Holy Spirit and ask for his help on a daily basis. Yeah. Because you can try to do it. Maybe right. you'll stop for a day, two, a week. But those things can easily, right? The Bible tells us to lay aside every sin that easily besets us. But you can lay it aside and you can easily fall into the trap. But when the Holy Spirit helps you and empowers you, you are able to overcome that and move forward in your walk with Christ. That's good. Um, so, so this is not in the paper. I'm just, I'm just now, from what you've, you've mentioned, it is by the Holy Spirit. What happens when someone, a believer, is trying to use, you know, the positive quotes, the, the motivational quotes? Like, is there a balance to it? Would you say do both? Do one or the other? Are you referring just, to, like, the... You know, like secular quotes and such. <laughs> okay, so let's say you know the there there is the positive mindset thinking um, trend that is out there. So just putting it into practical terms, um, we have the scripture, we have the word of God, and we have the Holy Spirit. And you just mentioned we can't do it without Him. So would you say it's okay to combine positive quote, or would you just say just the Holy Spirit, like? I'm just throwing it out there for you. So my, my belief is this. Everything, whether it's a positive mindset or whatever, like as the um, James Allen, the author of yes. As a Man Think It, yes. that yeah. is the premise of the whole book yeah. is based on the scripture. Yeah. So everything, like nothing is new under the sun. Everything mm -hmm. that we'll all need to discover that will be discovered in the next, all those motivational folks will discover in the next hundred years is already yeah. in the scriptures. Right. So I don't, I think your first point of call mm -hmm. of reference is the word of God. Right. That's really how you renew your mind. You're able to really um, lay those things aside. You're able to, um, to renew your mind essentially. Now, is it wrong to look to those other things? I don't think it's necessarily wrong, but you have to really be careful because there are a lot of different mindsets, a lot of different theories out there that may look good, but if you dig a little deeper, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, right you know, the, the law of attraction. And there's so right. many. So, I mean, we don't have to go into all of that. But I would say let the scripture be your first point of call. Yes. Yes. And if there's, yeah, just look at the scriptures yes. <laughs> for that. Pastor Kala, what do you say? Thank uh, you for that position. I, I absolutely believe that there must be an anchor because everything in this world changes. It's the only thing that does not change. That's the word of God. So the anchor is this opinions, ideologies, philosophies change. Uh, nothing is permanent. So yes, there, personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with having, because Philippians 4, 8 says it clearly, it says whatever things are true, are lovely, of good report, or for the rest of it, yeah, it says think on these things. Um, and I think it's important because I've gone through, this, every time I read the scripture, I always see that God speaks where he wants people to be, not where he finds them. Oftentimes, people talk about, what, me? I'm not qualified. God always says, I've chosen you to do that. And so, in order for us to walk and change certain things, we've got to see what God says. And to see what God says, those words, the Bible says, God has spoken once, twice have I heard. Those words have to resonate in our mindset so that we begin to act and behave like what God says. That's why I said the word must be the first thing. So if you look at every time, whether it's Mary, whether it's Abraham, whether it's Jonah, 
all those people where there's uh, Gideon, God spoke to them based on where he thought, they, where he sees them going. And God never speaks about our present. It speaks about what possibilities he can do through us. So in order to shed where you are, that's the biggest thing for us. We have to let by start speaking the word God says, not the where we are. I am this, I'm that. So I believe in the power of confession because you become what you say. We're all an accumulation of words spoken by us or spoken by others to us. Now, I also firmly believe that the fastest way to do that is not just the confession, but it's with the help of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit reminds you of what God says. The Bible says he will bring it to light. So you will realize that this is not aligning with his word. This is what he said. And I believe that an encounter with the Holy Spirit can remove an addiction of many years, can remove anger of many years can remove a bad behavior if you absolutely submit. So that's actually one of the fastest way. But I also believe in confession. Can I throw two more things about how yes, to sir. let go of denial? Yes, the other thing I would throw up there is this, that we should also learn to be, how can I let go? By being accountable. So oftentimes, the, one of the things that affects us as believers is we live in this solitary world. And if you look at what the world is saying, they're saying, stay by yourself. And when you stay by yourself, nobody judges you. Nobody evaluates you. I'm not saying put ourselves to be judged, but nobody can make you accountable. If I'm struggling with something, I'm better off saying to you that I'm struggling with something so that I can be accountable. Not because, obviously, you're not talking about people who are just going to judge you, but you're talking about people who will say, you know what, I have genuine interest in you and I want to see you get through it and my ability to share with someone I said the proof of pursuit uh, proof of desire is in pursuit so if I want to change something I have to pursue that I want to see this thing change and putting myself out there as difficult as it may be is one of the fastest way to turn things around because someone can call you out if if I stole and nobody knows I stole Nobody can tell me you stole because I stole and I kept it myself. But if I'm stealing and someone sees me stealing and say, hey, brother, you said you ain't going to steal again, it's always a new grace. The last one, the other part is this, that, so I talk about, is to take it daily. Many of us think we know God, we believe God, we want to deny. So all of a sudden, I'm born again, I'm following God, this should not happen to me again. No. It took you so much to get to where you are. It's going to take you some time as you walk through that, right? David said, do I walk through the valley of a shadow of death? I will fear no evil for you are with me. So God still helps you through. The biggest thing is holding on to the name, the life, the name of God or the anchor that never shakes, never changes to get through. So the Holy Spirit, as she mentioned, you mentioned something about confession, which is true. The third, second one is the impact of accountability. And the third one is daily crucify yourself. You fail, start again tomorrow. You fail, start again tomorrow. Daily, do that. Like Just take one day at a time and don't give yourself, I'm going to lose weight. Say, I will. So I'm going to lose weight. It's right to say, I'm going to lose weight. Just say, I will do this today. I will show up here tomorrow, today. And that just tells you something you can be committed to, not the outcome of what you're looking for. Right. Okay. And if I can just emphasize what Pastor Carlos said about accountability. If you look at the, and I think one thing that the enemy tries to do these days is isolate, get you feeling isolated, right? Whether is it's in your Christian walk, um, your walk with God, or in any challenge that you're going through, the enemy tries to keep you by yourself so that you don't, you, you know, you're not able to reach out for support, particularly from other believers. But if you look at the disciples, when they started following Christ, they didn't go, they're not, they were not hermits, right? Even after Christ left, when they were saved, they were coming together. And the Bible tells us, I think in the book of Proverbs, that iron sharpens iron, right? So if you are and that's why it's so important after, you know, you, you receive Christ, they say the um, believer's prayer, is that what it's, we call it? They, and we, you're encouraged to follow, you know, to go to a Bible-believing church because if you don't, if you don't separate yourself, I think of people who go into the witness protection program, right? The identity is changed. Literally, when you re receive Christ, you have a new identity. Now, you don't physically have to uproot yourself from your, from your geography, but the things around you that you associate yourself with, with they have to change and being in the company of believers that can hold you accountable will keep you grounded so you're not easily fall you're not falling um and going backwards great so we don't want to remain or be in isolation um and you also mentioned um apart from accountability remember the holy spirit and then take it daily denying ourselves daily 
So denying ourselves as in denying the flesh, right, daily. Okay. The selfish. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the third question I have here, I'm going to throw it out to the audience first. Um, this is the person who wrote, what does it mean when the Bible says, oh, thank you. If you can please have a mic for us, um, our amazing technical team. It says, what does it mean when the Bible says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, and I'll read the verse in Luke 9, verse 26, how do I know if I am ashamed? So Luke 9, 26, that the person wrote is, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. So how, how do we as Christians know if we are ashamed? Ashamed of Christ, ashamed of the gospel. How do we know if we are ashamed? We don't all have to speak at once. I see faces. How do we know if we are ashamed? Okay, and oh, okay. I'm 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 gonna start calling names because I kn I know faces. They will hold the mic. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, before I answer your last. Uh, last question. I want to ask for a little bit input to the two questions that you have. Okay. Sure. Okay. For a new believer or somebody who just want to have interest in following through, number one, you have to have that decision. You are that I am going to follow through what I believe, and the only way you can be successful is to be conversant with the Word of God. Because you can't quote the word you don't know. So when trouble comes, if you don't have the word in you, you won't be able to, you know, to say anything that the, Bible, the word of God says. And that is Joshua 1, 8. It says, if you want to be successful in any area, the word of God must be in you. And for you to overcome any attack or any problem, the Bible says, put it up on, you need to take authority. You must know who you are in the Lord. And when trouble comes, when that flesh go and steal, the Bible says, put it under. That is what uh, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 4 to 5 says. You just put it under the authority of God. This is what the word of God says. If you don't know what the word of God says concerning your trouble, it is very difficult for you to overcome it. And when the word of God says it, you must have the art of obedience to the word of God. This is what the world has said. And you must know how to surrender and submit and yield to the word of God, not to your flesh. The flesh will be telling you, do it, do it. You have to wait. Am I to list it? whose report shall I believe? So you must be a friend of the word of God. You must dip yourself into the word of God. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things, all things, those all things will not just go away. There are part of all that we need to work on it day by day, as the pastor has said. Praise the Lord. Now, the question now you asked, when someone say, I'm a believer, and some, maybe you are in your working place, or you go outside, and something happens, and it's a, it's a big confrontation to your belief, and you shy away. You can't say anything. Ah, I don't want to get in, involved. It means you deny the one you say you, you believe. So we must be, for you, you know, anywhere you cannot come out as a child of God, you, are feel, you feel shame uh, because this one will intimidate me. Oh, it can let me lose that and that. You don't take your stand, you are denied God. Thank and you deny the faith. Thank you for that um, great contribution, Grandma. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, Pastor Collard mentioned that after the invitation is a decision. You have to make a decision to follow Christ. So she uh, mentioned how you know you are ashamed. One example is when you shy away from um, your faith. If someone asks you about your faith, um, do we have any other addition, any other contribution to how do I know if I am ashamed? Before I give one of the pastors, Sister Jumi, thank you. Um, from my perspective, I think the person asking the question already knows that they're ashamed. Um, because um, there's a tendency when you are hypocritical about something, and like maybe you say, oh, I go to a church that don't wear earrings or something like that, and you go to parties and you have earrings on, you know for a fact that if you see a pastor coming in there, you'll be like, oh my goodness, you're gonna to try to take it off. So you know for a fact that you're hypocritical or maybe you are shying away from the gospel or being uh, ashamed of Christ. So I, from my perspective, I think the person already knows and it takes the Holy Spirit to be able to help you to get to that level where you'll be firm with your faith that you can say, I'm not gonna waver. Um, what I know and what I know. And again, goes back to the word of God. If you embed yourself so much in the word of God, you will find yourself knowing that you know that you know the person that is sending you what is capable of doing. And you will just feel like, you know what, I, I, I have to stand for him. That's what I'm thinking. Thank you. Thank you for that addition. So standing firm in the word and not living a double life, just living out the word. Um, inside out. Any other person has any contribution, any addition? I'm looking at our ministers. <laughs> All right, um, go ahead. Um, Pastor Shane, it looks like you're ready to say well, something. So I wanted to add to that, that, you know, when you're ashamed of someone, so we're going to take the scripture as is, we're not going to add to it or subtract from it, but when you're ashamed of someone or something, you, you want to dissociate yourself from it. So like grandma said, just yeah. denying Christ. But I also believe that if you actually read that a scripture, it says deny or ashamed of me and my words. So my words, my teachings, my instructions yeah. on this point to be a disciple, right? To follow and make fishers, you know, be fishers of men. So I believe that it's not just saying, you know, refusing to raise your hand when they're asking for believers. It's also refusing denying his instructions, right? Denying him the pleasure of your obedience. Um, I believe that's also that's being ashamed deep. of. That, that's deep right that's, that's awesome. I love that. That's a very important thing. Very great contributions, everyone. You know, if I would just say something, add something to that, um, which came up with what they were saying, it kind of inspired a few things in me. Uh, the first one is this, when you said denying yourself and also denying the word, uh, you know, it just begs the question. I think you brought the same thing, like, how can you be a follower yet deny? You are not yet a disciple. It's an oxymoron. It's a paradox. It's, it's impossible because I am a disciple. I'm a follower because I believe in the right. cause and I'm following, but yet deny that. Something. So when Jesus was saying, you know, if you choose that you want to go, know that you've got to deny. And so it says, you deny yourself. It says, but if you deny me on this earth, then I'm going to deny because you're not, it's easy to, you're not even me. You're not, you don't even say you are a disciple because you have, that's, what are you carrying? What message are you carrying when it's the only message you're carrying? And then the other thing that, that I want to bring back to what um, uh, my sister Brett mentioned there was just a question about, you know, I think it was Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus for there's a power of God unto salvation to them that believe. And, and for me, I just look at it and say, the moment I des the, deny the word of God or deny God, maybe I'm denying the power of something to happen. So when God says, you know, like, uh, if you deny me, the fact deny, uh, it, it means you're not just denying God, you know, the, which he said, I'm going to deny before my father. I'm going to deny uh, the angels. And it's like, boy, you deny, you lose. It's like you disconnect from the powerhouse of heaven to get anything that you trust, even to see somebody else saved. So you have disconnected entirely. So for me, when I look at that is that, our ability to stay true to the course, for God to stand in for us, is our ability, it starts with our ability to beat our chest and say, I'm standing in for him. We're the only ambassador, he's God on earth. So why don't we just stand for him? That's good. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
and it's, you know, it's a, it's a good place to also encourage anyone who maybe you have been in a position where, you know, you, you felt like you held back and um, you didn't want people to know that you're a Christian or you did something. Um, it's a good place for you to know that all hope is not lost. Um, thank God for grace. You know, Peter denied Jesus and, and Jesus three times. Three times, and Jesus was still gracious enough to, he's one of the apostles' family. So it's a good place just to encourage um, us all. It, it's, you can come back. <laughs> Hold on to the faith. I, I was going to say that it's happened to the best of us. I, I know times when I've been very scared. Not scared, very, uh, it's not a bad word, but it's ashamed, hesitant, right? Uh, and then you want to say, I, you know, I, I'm a believer, but you know, I, I, I go to church. You don't want to talk about, cool yeah, you want to be the cool believer, right? But um, you have to just go to a point where you say, look, I either die for the gospel, lose my life on earth, or lose it somewhere else. I die for the gospel or, or nothing else. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, you know, I just a good segue to the next question, because Pastor Kola, uh, you mentioned to pick up our cross um, and I, I think that is the second teaching where you talked about the cost of discipleship. In the book of Matthew, um, chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I like when you said in the teaching, you were like, the cross is something you have to pick up. You have to make that decision to, to carry it. So how, the question says, how would I know what my cross is? I'll start with Pastor Shin. Pastor Kala is looking straight ahead. Pastor Kala's Sh question. <laughs> <laughs> the question, so how would I know? How do I know what my cross is? So your cross is your burden, right? So Jesus was, I think it was in Mark as well, that he was talking about giving up your life. So whatever, whatever it take for you to lay aside in order to follow him, I believe that's your cross, right? He says, um, there was a part of the scriptures where he talked about some will, um, if you leave father and mother and all of these things, not necessarily to abandon your family, but it's just putting away those things, those distractions that can take you away from following him, from um, from that relationship or that intimacy with him. It could be sin, it could be, um, you know, just idleness, whatever it is, right? Um, I believe that's what your cross is. Yes, thank you. I, I want to I wanna bring it up to what I, I said there, um, and kind of what God revealed to me about that. And the truth about it is that, and you mentioned this just now, that we have to deliberately pick up, or was it you said, pick up the cross. For me to deliberately pick it up, for me to deliberately pick it up, it's only because I chose to follow. So I pick up not because I'm a believer, <laughs> I pick up my cross when I know my assignment. So I believe that the cross is always tied to your purpose in Christ. What do I mean by this? The cross is something you have to say, I've count this is what I'm picking up for the sake of this gospel there. So oftentimes, let me give an example. An evangelist must believe that um, the cross is the doors will be shut in front of you. It must believe that you get a lot of no's probably get hit mail or something like that. A part of a cross of a, a pastor is the fact that you will see some people come in, they will say very nice things about you, they walk, I mean, there's so many things. Pastoring is a whole different, it's a whole, you know, whole different thing when it comes to that. We talk about the people who are singing, part of a cross must be the fact that everyone in the place of your calling, there's a cross that needs to be picked up, that needs to be said, that you say, this, this is what I know I am going to, have to pick up to fulfill the gospel. Missionaries would know that they would have to face mosquitoes. They would have to face different. That's that's the you at home would not know that, but that's a cross they have to pick up for that purpose of that mission. So I believe that you pick up the cross when you choose to follow because you know the calling that God has for you, and that's why the cross will be different for different people it says must pick up your own cross because jesus on the way to calvary picked up his own cross and nobody picked that up for him but for the purpose for his calling and if i can just add to that i think picking up the cross can be both a positive like 
a subtraction and an addition, right? So removing the things that will hinder you um, from following that purpose and also doing the things that's required, right? So whatever it is, as you know, if God has called you to, to be a singer or to you know, be a psalmist, it's going to take some things, right? You're not just going to have to let go and make some sacrifice. You're going to have to make some sacrifices, equipping yourself to, to do so. So. I don't know why you pointed. You said psalmist. That was like, you're putting me on the spot. But thank you for that. Thank you for um, shedding some light on that. All right. Um, so back to our, our audience. What is a disciple? We've been talking about discipleship. Um, said it over and over again. Um, anyone want to shed some light on what is a disciple? What is a disciple? Sorry, I don't know who asked the question, but I, I would have phrased that as who is. Who is a, a disciple? disciple? And what does it mean to be a disciple? So right. who is a disciple? And maybe in the context of what we are also, what we've been learning and and studying who is a disciple who is a disciple bless the lord on oh my soul <laughs> who is a disciple i know it's a i mean you can literally check the yes sir thank you <laughs> you can literally check the dictionary no don't check the dictionary i'm just kidding Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I want to go to a different direction. Okay. He said, by this, your men know you're my disciple when you love one another. Yes, sir. So I believe a true disciple of uh, Christ is somebody who emits the love, you know, for his fellow human being. You know, somebody once asked uh, Jesus a question and he said, um, um, you shall love the Lord thy God, you know, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So I believe a disciple of Christ is not just somebody who is evangelizing, you know, but it's somebody who emits love, you know, in his environment. Thank you. That's, yes, that's good. That's good. Thank you. So it's like a characteristic of love. I mean, characteristic of disciple is love. Okay. A ministry manual. I, I've been volunteered. Anyways, we, we know that a disciple is someone Literally speaking, is someone who believes in a philosophy or believes in a person. Usually, it's someone that's above of you. You believe in what they stand for, and you model your life according to that. In the context of we being believers, the disciples, like we see in scriptures, they believed in Jesus. When Jesus met the first two disciples, uh, apostles who eventually became disciples, they believed in him, and then they followed. It wasn't it wasn't really about thinking of what they would benefit. It, just like you said, it was that was their own cross because they were leaving all of what the their livelihood as fishermen and follow Jesus. So a disciple is one who believes in Jesus as our Lord, our personal Savior. And then we model our life after him by following him. So when we talk about following Jesus, we're essentially saying we are following the teachings. We are following the beliefs. Jesus, Jesus' beliefs was very clear in scriptures because you did not really need to think to know what Jesus stood for. He was in the open. And, and the disciples knew it by following him. So I believe that as Christians, for us to truly be disciples, First of all, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ when we confess salvation. And then we have to follow the teachings, the, the prescriptions of scriptures, the, the, the duties of, of being a believer. Because you, many times we say we are Christians when we believe, but when it comes to taking the responsibility of the body, then we shy away. So I believe that a disciple is someone who believes in Jesus and follows the teachings and the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I mean, that's that's pretty much a summary of it's a disciple is a lifelong committed follower and server of Christ who makes disciples of others. And, and I think that's pretty much the summary. Pastor, you're holding. OK. All right. Um, well, you know, that goes to the next question. So 
um, Pastor Shion, you had talked about the rewards of um, discipleship, of discipling. And um, I believe one of the ones you said was that Christ himself is the reward. This question, um, this person is asking, well, will I be less blessed if I do not disciple? Do I get less blessing? If I just decide I want to I want to be, I just want to come to church, I follow Jesus, I believe in Christ, I don't want to go out preaching the gospel, telling other people about, about Christ, I don't want to disciple other people, would, would there be less blessings? So if you just choose to stop at the believer level, receives Christ, that's all well and good. You'll make it to heaven. But that's not what, that's not the reason, right? Christ was not selfish. He wants us to propagate the gospel. Now, that, yeah, yes, you will be less blessed because one, uh, we know the Bible says in Hebrews 6, um, 11, 6, I think B, it says God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And we know that there are, through and through, and last time, I believe last week we talked about all the, the rewards that come with being a disciple, discipling others to follow Christ. So I believe so because, um, what was it, the crown of righteousness, there are different things, um, the blessings that just come with that. And I believe that when you please God, right, God did not come just to save you and have you just sit and look pretty and make it to heaven in your mansion, but he wants you to share that love with others so they can also receive him. And when you do that, which is his heart cry, he is going to bless you, not just here on earth, but in heaven as well. So yes, your mansion will be bigger. You have crowns. So you will be less blessed. You're really um, shortchanging yourself if you just stop at that decide. I mean, that's selfish. And that's, God is not selfish if you don't, um, if you don't follow him and then disciple others, then you are shortchanging yourself. Okay, so it's the person really... Um you're not saying less blessed, but you're just saying you're de denying yourself some rewards that, you know, you should. You should try to get, right? The Bible says that he who wins souls is wise. And I think even in the book of Revelation, it mentions some blessings, that rewards that comes with enduring and finishing the race. And, G uh, and who is a Paul said, now awaits for me. So even thinking about that, there are blessings. Pastor Kola, do you want to add anything to that, the blessings? Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I always struggle with just the idea that following Christ is only for the blessings of what I'm going to get from it. I struggle from that because then then I'm, I make the gift bigger than the, big, the giver. I, I struggle with that because I think the first thing is the relationship we have with him. And I know that some of the blessings are hidden in that, but... I just don't know. See, there are two ways to backslide. The, the two ways to backslide. Huh? No one's taking notes. Yes, two ways to backslide. Yes. Number one, you can decide to go back. Uh, number two is the fact that the world can go forward. If you just stand still, you are backsliding. See, because the world is moving, God is moving. And here's the thing, if you stand still, you don't study the word, you don't do that, you would lose the love for God, the love of God. And there's no way that that, that just, it just, it begins to disintegrate, just begin to, there's no way you just say, I marry your wife, that's it, and then move away. You would, some, you would grow apart. And when you grow apart, that's why it's, it, it, Jesus never said, you're a believer, now stay. He said, follow me. And if you go through many ways we can look at it, if you go through scripture, not just about the blessing, but talk about the fact that, the key word of follow is that beginning of the scripture says, if anyone desires to follow me, or I think it starts with to come after me, he must da, 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 and follow me. There are three things. Deny yourself, pick up a cross, follow me. So it says that, listen, the whole essence of who a disciple is, is to do those things. You cannot be stagnant because stagnation would never yield any fruit. Again, you talked about selfishness. You talked about, um, imagine, the Bible says not to be self-conceited. The Bible says, talks about, we should not, what are you going to be praying to God? Why didn't God kill you? Because you are, you, are, you are useless to the body of Christ at that point. And say, listen, you're born again, go to heaven, right? But God left you here for a reason. I'm number three. 
Mark 16, 17 says, 15, 16 says, this is the reason he said, go into the world, preach the gospel. The reason he gave us the Holy Spirit is so that we can live this life and be able, I mean, the essence of what it is, that's why I think it's a dangerous level to just say, I believe in God. And it's just like, I marked the register, I got my admission, but I don't go to school. My drop, okay. I, I All right. About okay, so thank you for that. Um, Pastor Sheon, you had mentioned that God is the first reward of disciple, um, of a disciple. Isn't God also our reward for being righteous? Um, this isn't a special reward, then, so why should I be motivated to be a disciple? I think what the question is saying is since God himself, like you, Todd, is a reward for following and for being a disciple well god himself is also a reward for for living righteous for anything that we do right pastor color that's what you said the last time that was one of your answers um yes that christ himself the intimacy with christ that should always be the first thing yes. not necessarily the yes. gifts that we yes. get or blessings so the question is saying this isn't a special reward i don't know why that irks me a little but um, it's saying, why should I be motivated? Basically, what other motivation? I'll throw it out to Pastor Kola first. Yeah, well, because the question itself was, was throwing me a little bit off in terms of... Um, I think they're asking for basically what else. Uh, I, I think it's similar to what was before, as in, if I'm righteous... I've got Christ as uh, my reward, then why do I have to look at Christ as a reward for discipling? I already have him as a reward for righteousness. Um, and I think it goes back to some things we talked, I, we mentioned earlier. Uh, I think you have to understand, that <laughs> I don't know if you really, if you really, this is, I don't know if you really have Christ as a reward. I mean, the value, uh, uh, when I look at reward, I'm talking about for making a decision, right? I don't think you really have Christ as a reward for being righteous. You didn't qualify. He made you righteous. <laughs> In the first so your qualification does not bring, you know, oh, I've made right. Like, it's like you're doing somebody a favor for doing that. Uh, I don't think you do that, but I think, I think that's why I realized that you never know the value or benefits of following God until you actually follow. I don't think anyone gets the benefit of knowing what America or another country or go to work for a company bring on to actually work for that company. You can imagine, look at it, but you have to follow because, you know, in most companies now, if you, if you go with them, they will give you stock options vested over three years or four years or five years. What they're saying is when you are dedicated to this, you will start to get the, the reward of that. And so the whole drive-through Christianity, I, I think it's only for the moment. Um, eventually, you need to press on because the reward comes when we press on in our intimacy with God. And if I'll just add to that, really, um, Christ being our reward, or God being the first reward, the reward of the obedience, right, is that you once you answer his call, he's tell, giving you an instruction, then you are guaranteed of his presence, right? He's backing you. If he tells you to do something, you do it, then you can be you can be sure that he's going to get your back no matter what happens, right? You can trust him to lead you. I believe it's in Isaiah 45. It was talking about Cyrus. God holds his right hand. God holding your right hand, you following him, you're going to have his presence. You're going to have his power, his authority. You're going to be able to walk in that. And every blessing that you, that you, um, that God has proposed for you, on that path, you will you will receive. So God being our reward is, I mean, as it relates to the topic, yes, that is true. It's also true in any area of our lives in obedience to Christ or to God. Thank you for for answering the question, and um, I'll I'll just throw this in there that God is everything. Yeah. I mean, like I know we say God, 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 but He's everything like when you think about he made the universe he made everything so the question saying that this isn't a special reward it is a special reward that's that, that's pretty big all right i'll move on to the next question we're almost through i'll throw this out to um family so it's saying pastor um Shane had taught us that one of the rewards of discipleship is provision I believe you mentioned provision and preservation. So why are believers living in poverty? 
why are believers living in poverty? You know, why do why do people keep losing jobs and, and failing at different ventures? You know, and, and oh, same with preservation. <laughs> Belie- believers still die. That's a it's a mouthful, it's a deep one. But this person is asking, you know, not every Christian is rich. Not every Christian is a billionaire. So even poverty, why are believers living in poverty? Thank you, Sister Naji. So it comes to our mindset, right? For me, receiving Christ makes you rich already. It depends it depend on what, how your belief is. But if you sit down and think about where you're from and where you are now, you can say that you are rich already. And the Bible didn't say that everything will come like that, like a magic or something. You have to go, go to some uh, storm up and down, and then you continue, you know? Oh, thank you. Thank you. So in this life, there will be tribulation. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So she said, it's not, it's not, there's no magic to it. Um, and uh, Mrs. Bakar, is it Mrs. Bakare? Okay, Mrs. Bakare. Why are believers living in poverty? I think that question, like you rightly said, is loaded. And it's not one that has just one answer. Because I believe there'll be various reasons for different people. But one point that I just want to make is, like most things, like believing in Christ, you have to make a decision first. Christ died, right? And salvation is available, but you have to be willing to accept it and then choose to be a disciple and go further, right? So put that side by side with this. God has made provision available. He has put gifts and talents in you, things that you can trade. And he has put in principles in his word. Again, to what grandma said, you have to know the word. He has given you promises that you can negotiate with spiritually and then bring that into manifestation physically. If you take responsibility, there's the part of responsibility on our part. And I'm not saying, again, that anyone who is not rich is not responsible. Like I said, Mm -hmm. it's multifaceted. It's not the only thing. There are many things surrounding it. However, if you dig deep into the promises your father has given you in the word, Mm -hmm. trade and figure out, okay, in this, which is responsible for where I am now? Which part fits me? What do I need to do? And then actually do the work, of course, in partnership with the Holy Spirit, because he alone can truly give you the answers and guide you. Yeah. Responsibility, really. That's a good answer. Good answer. Um... Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Uh, praise God. Yes. I think we sometimes we miss the meaning of being rich. Riches is not depend on money alone. Every child of God, we are blessed, we are rich. For you may not be a billionaire, there are things money cannot buy that God just give to us. Sometimes you wonder, I didn't pray for this, and it just come. It didn't just come. So riches is more than money. And we Christians, we are, some of us are lack because of lack of mismanagement of what we have. We don't know how to manage resources. We are going, and sometimes we Christians, we fail to follow the principle. When we are not following the principle of God is meant for the whole wide world. The unbelievers are rich because they are givers. Some of us Christians, we are so stingy. We hold on to a little thing we have. Because we hold on to it, we are unable to receive the biggest something that God has for us. God is not at fault. We are at fault. So when we follow the, either you believe Jesus or not, if you follow the principle of sow and reaping, you are going to be blessed. And what I'm saying is that riches is more than money. Good act. Able body. Roof over your head. You, you have car. You, you, back home I'm from Nigeria, you sleep. Some of us sleep on the floor, on the mat. When you come here, you, have this, you can choose any type of bed you want. Back home, when you wear slippers, the slippers cut off, you use needle to sew it. When you get here, you're not doing all that. 
you know, you open your closet and you take whatever you, that's the riches that we are enjoying by no Jesus. And that is why the Bible says, don't be anxious for all these things. The unbeliever are doing are anxious for it, they get it. So we Christians, we need to change our attitude to the way we serve God. Yes, we when we are when we go, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, she's about to start preaching. All right, sister. Um, I'm gonna go to Mr. Wasi, then uh, Mr. Namdi, Sister Kemi. So Mr. Manage, Wasi. Yes. Oh no. Oh, okay, no. okay. Uh, Mr. Namdi and then Sister Kemi. Um, the Bible said something. It said, it's not of him that we let, nor him that run it, but it's of the Lord that showed mercy. You know, a long time ago, uh, when I was in my undergrad, somebody asked me the same question. And um, you look at it, in Exodus 20, God said something. It says, um, for I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation, and showing mercy unto a thousand generation to them that love God. So you look at two scenarios. Some people were born just like Esau and Jacob. He says in Romans chapter 9, he said, they don't know anything, but Esau have loved, Jacob have hated. Right. So before even they came, some people had the ministry of iniquity on them, and some people have a thousand generation mercy on them. That's why you can see two people. One is a believer, one is an unbeliever, and one is flying, and the other one is as if he's carrying a mountain behind him. You know, how you know this, in Isaiah 58 from verse 2, he talked about a group of people. He said, these people, they seek to know the ordinances of God, and they do righteousness. But he said, yet, they are crying. He said, wherefore have we prayed, and thou hearest not. So even in prayer, even in a lot of things, there is a mercy, a platform of mercy, that of God that is bestowed. The question is, is how do we get that platform of mercy? You know, Hebrew 4, you know, 16 says, let us come therefore boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. You know, there are other aspects, you know, like my sister mentioned. You know, in Second Peter, you know, pastor was reading the other place. He said, wherefore has he given us exceeding great and precious promises that by this we may be partakers of his divine nature so you can recreate your world. But he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge. So you must have the knowledge for us to be able to change it. So in a nutshell is this, there is such as iniquity that people are born and they are born into suffering. They are born and no matter what they do, you know, it's as if they are struggling. But there's a way out. That's what the scripture has said. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's deep. Thank you. Amen. Sister Kemi. Yeah, I just want to <laughs> add on to everything they've said because it's just addition. Um, the Yorubans will say, en kadara. Agba Kodoro. <laughs> so what it means is that if you refuse to accept the will of God, you get nothing. The Holy Spirit prays according to the groaning, uh, groaning, but according to the will of God. I believe that as Christians, the reason why we pray is to understand and to hear from the Holy Spirit. Are we really obeying what the Spirit is saying? And secondly is, as Christians, I still stand on the will of God. When God says he made the rich, he made the poor. It's part of the Christians, are part of the rich and the poor. What makes you different? Why, are you big? why, is, why, why is your position has to be changed and asking for mercy? Have you taught the will of the master? He taught the will of the master on the cross, even to the point of death. That is is the discipleship we took when we said we believe in Christ. Amen, amen. Thank you all. Um, Pastor Kola, you want to round it up? Uh, yes, let me just, I, I thank you very much, everyone, and very great contributions. Uh, I want to say two things. Uh, well, two different, uh, yeah, you get what I'm saying. Uh, when we talk about, <clears throat> that's a very good question when God's, but the question is, how come, um, let me just go through it. Oftentimes, we evaluate our wealth and riches against somebody else or against a standard that we have. So oftentimes, we'll say, I'm rich only because I'm not up to this person. Um, if you look inward, you look at yourself and see that you brought something very important. Where I am or where God, where I am with God, um, 
uh, where I was without God, where I am with God, you will always see the difference. Sometimes there's something people say, and I think Grandma said it. Some people, we can't buy peace. Um, I think about it, say this, you, you, you can buy bed, but you can't buy sleep. So there's some people that will give all of what they have to sleep for two hours. We know a popular musician that could not sleep yet had so much world money. Is that riches? So reality is when we look at that and say, well, I want to be, have some money that he's got, then we bring a world of comparison, and that always puts us in trouble. But Second Corinthians chapter 8, 9, or 9, 8, or one of it, it says, it says that he, um, we know, please put it up, Second chapter 9, verse 8, it says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. And there's another part, the one I'm looking for is actually says that we know the grace that was upon the Lord Jesus Christ, that, when, that though he was rich, it became poor, 8, 9. For we, you know the grace upon the Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now let me give you a good example. It was a choice Jesus made. They asked Jesus for, for tax. Jesus said, go to the ocean, catch the first fish. Take the coin from the first. One coin solved the problem of taxes. One coin. That means that coin must not be like, it must be like a million dollar coin inside of it. It might be maybe a, 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 um, a big ring or uh, a diamond ring. One coin solved the problem. Jesus met um, 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 the disciples. The first thing he did with them, he said to them, he said, you've got no fish. They were poor. They met with Jesus. Next thing he said, cast your net on the right side. Jesus knew everything. He could, they could sell that fish and become wealthy. If they want. He could go every day and say, Jesus, you be the seer. We shall be the catcher. Just tell us where we should point to and we'll catch it. But Jesus said to him, what he was trying to say is, I can make all these things available. As a matter of fact, being me, everything's available. But oftentimes as believers, a couple of things. The Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We are putting, sometimes put the gift to evaluate our understanding of Christ, our relationship. We look at, if I don't have this, does that mean I don't know God? Or the person that has it, does that mean they know God? One. Other things, like, you're absolutely right, this can go to many, to many ways. Other things, because we are not opening our minds to the principles that govern. Listen, the Bible says he makes the sun shine on the unbeliever and the believer alike. Why are some people making it, other people not? Because our capacity has been about, i got to pray about this thing. And when God says, launch out into the deep. They didn't say, God said, launch into the deep. They didn't say, deep. They didn't say, Lord, let me pray. Is he you speaking? If he's not you speaking, they just acted on the launch into deep. And that's it. So oftentimes we become so very myopic, so very small in our thinking. When the Bible says your father is one that owns a cattle on a thousand hills, we become so myopic. What stops you from reaching out loud? The biggest thing about believers is this. Don't compromise on your values. Don't compromise on who you are. If a deal is looking like it's going to be shady, walk away from it. Because you know that the God who made you rich is not the one that made you, that requires you to compromise. Do you understand what I'm saying? And there's the thing, the last one I'll say is about Matthew chapter 6, 33. It says, and this is one thing happens with believers. Many of us want to run to God with problems, but run to the world with riches. We have not made God our all sufficiency. 6, 6, um, 6, 6 uh, 33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then everything will be added unto you. There are some times when, you know, uh, I, I was giving a story about Ron Canali, and I said to you that he left the world, and he came to God, and he said, Lord, even if you don't do anything, I'm not going to leave here. The people of the world were calling him to come back. He says, that has almost ruined my marriage. Maybe you do not know, he's, he's been separated six times. Six times. I said, no more. His kids had already gone into the world. He said, no more. Not long after, they started calling him. Today, the father of praise and worship as we know it today is Ron Canale. You all know that. But if he had, what does that look like? Everywhere he goes, he's a sought after. He's not looking at the riches from what he said. I had attained every milestone I set for myself. 
He was not looking at what the world, he had tasted the world. He's not looking at what the world is looking at as, as evaluation for what success is. But it says, Lord God, I'm going to evaluate success from what it is. Not long after I started worshiping, you remember the song, Welcome Home, the album Welcome Home? It was really about his children. You don't know, God, goodness, you guys don't know Welcome Home? Women? Okay, I, I know Welcome Home. Welcome Home was a time, was the first time his kids came back to sing with him. He had lost his kids. And the song, that was the first album the kids came to sing with him. To him, he would say, take all the wealth and riches in the world and give me children who serve God. Today, his kids, one is a worship pastor. The other one is, 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 a, is a musician. Another one is, they just write in the kingdom. Now, many of us, many of us, we can pursue the money today, but then not pursue what the world thinks is status, but not pursue what God says. And then you can gain all this. Scripture says, what profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose your soul. Um, I would rather look through the rest of my world through the lens of God rather than look at the world and look at and, and only borrow the lens from God. I want to look through the lens of God. If God could make um, Solomon wealthy, Give him wisdom, make him, make him wealthy. God could bless David where he gave, he said, I give to the house of the Lord. Nobody gave more than this, more than me. If he could say that, then this God, his promises is that we'll be wealthy. But which way we see it matters. And that becomes the anchor through which we begin to see what we read. Like the man of God shared with us. You have to understand that God makes the provision. But it also says you have to understand what I've put behind it to, be, to, to get that provision. But know this. He's your God that is able to give you do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. According to the, the power that works in us. God has made it. He says, I know. He can make a way where there seems to be no way. Sometimes success is the fact that I could not get into that room. I got into that room. But you got into the room, but you had nothing to say. And now you wonder God opened the door. God opened the door, but you have nothing to say. So it's, it's multifaceted in the sense that you have to understand the personality of Jesus, the principles of God, and you have to see the God's understanding of wealth and riches through the lens of God, not through the lens of the comparison or from the, I just expect to have, uh, uh, I, can't do, I can't go to church because I said to myself, when I'm 30, I have to have a million dollars. You can make the million dollars at, at, at you can't, you, you can be waiting for the check, waiting for the check of a million dollars, and they say, come and collect it. And on the way to the check, you don't even see the million dollars. Remember, the Bible says that that man, rich fool, said, I have made the money. Now it's time for me to fold my arms. And now God said, today your life will be required of it. It was a parable to say, who is really your God? A provision, whether God makes it now or doesn't, we should live like the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I am not after what God will give. I'm after who God is. When I find who God is, then he will give me everything he has in his handbag because I walk with him. That is my answer to that. Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together for our panelists. Let's put our hands together for ourselves. Thank you all so much for your contribution. Please help me welcome. Um, okay. Help me welcome Pastor Kola for the communion. Amen. Well, it's time for the communion. Um, I really appreciate every contribution tonight. I, I, I hope... Um, we understand that um, we have a big task ahead of us. We're the only ambassador God has on this earth to, to do that. I also ask that us as Christians, don't limit yourself to just prayer and prayer alone. There's prayer and principle. Um, and on, on, begin to understand. Start a business. There's a gift in you that the world needs. And God did not put that gift in you just because he wants you to come back and pray for more way to use the gift. Launch out into the deep. Start a business. Do something out of what is given to you. Just take a moment and sit down. And say, what do I do differently from other people? And let God open your eyes and begin to launch into the day. And that's, uh, uh, listen, the way I always look at it is this. How will the church and the body of Christ be funded if Christians are not wealthy? 
How would we be funded if we're not wealthy? The world is not going to fund the Christian. The Christians should be proud to say, I am a use of God to fund the, the house of God. That's what Paul said in, in first, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and chapter 8. So these people give towards the work of God. And the 